Someone once said, I need Jesus. I don't merely need propositions from the Word. I need an encounter with the living Christ. Yeah. Except, how do we get Jesus? You know, not many people have a dream at night about Jesus. And even if they do have a dream, how do they know it's just not a bad cheese night? Um, not many people are walking down the road and an angel speaks to them. So when they say, I get Jesus, what does that mean? I feel him in my heart. How do you know it's not heartburn? You know, you really, it, it doesn't make any sense. We get Jesus through his word. And we need to remember that. And we're, when we're talking about apologetic preaching or persuasive preaching, the aim is not to say we're going to have preaching which answers everyone's objections. What we're doing is we're, we're, we're taking everything and it always comes to Christ. So, again, because of... Uh, time of things. Forgive me for the relative superficiality of this and just buzz in with questions at the end. What is persuasive preaching? Um, it's first of all, it's defense. You are defending things. There are things that will come up in the Bible and if you're an insane, intelligent, normal person, you're going to look and go, what? How's that in the Bible? And you're going to have to explain that. Now, you're not always going to be preaching through judges or whatever. Um, but if you do come across something like that, you've got to be really, what, what are people, what's being said here? I think it's very interesting to look at the book of Romans and realize that most of it is probably written as a response to questions. Um, I would regard preaching as interactive because although maybe in your um, tradition or congregation or whatever, people don't shout out, You've got to imagine that they are. You've got to be able to interpret their body language. And um, there is a, a, a defense, an apologia of the gospel. But it's also proclamation. You are not saying, well, uh, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and Wayne Grudem says this, and Tim Keller says this, and then I think this, and you take your pick. What you're saying is God says. So if God doesn't say it, don't say it. Or if God doesn't say it and you say it, preface it with, I'm not sure about this, but I think this. But when God says it, there should be an authority that comes with that. People heard Jesus because he spoke not like the scribes and Pharisees, but as someone who had authority. It's explanation. I, I, I just read the Bible and uh, I understand. No, you don't just read the Bible and you don't just understand it. It's why we've got teachers of the Bible. Because although the Bible can be read by anybody and the Holy Spirit can use it, in reality, we still need, like in the days of Ezra, someone to stand up and open up the Word of God, to explain what the Word of God says. I find that thrilling. I've been studying God's Word for decades. I've been preaching it for decades. And I still find coming to it really exciting. But for me just now, even more exciting, because um, I asked a guy to come and be uh, an assistant minister with me. And his name's Sinclair Ferguson. He's just fantastic. In my view, the best preacher in the world, in English, as far as I'm concerned. And I just, Sunday evenings, I just go, wow, I, I didn't even know. You know, he's not like he's looking for new things in the Bible. He's just teaching. You're going, wow, it's there. How didn't I see that? Because there's always new stuff coming out of God's Word. So it is explanation. Here's something where people in my tradition as Calvinists often get it wrong. It's also invitation to me always. Now, you may not have an altar call and probably shouldn't. Depends where you are, um, perhaps. Wouldn't work in my culture. You know, you want to accept Jesus, come on down the front, and you get the same guy doing it for 20 weeks in a row. You think, oh, you still not accepted him? Yeah, but I rejected him the following day. You know, well, but in terms of preaching, you are you're inviting people to respond all the time. It is invitation. Then um, it's rational, emotional, and spiritual. Preaching, it, it, it is, you are addressing the heart, but you're addressing the heart through the mind. I think a lot of preachers make the mistake of trying to get the feeling. That, you know, if only people would feel. I remember that time when I was in that service and I really felt the presence of God. So as a preacher, you try and get that feeling. But that's like trying to make somebody fall in love with you. It just makes you look an absolute idiot. It doesn't work. The feeling comes as a response, if you like. And for me, what you're doing is you're talking to people as human beings. 
But you are, you're, you're, you're addressing their minds, I think, that you're going to the heart, but you're going through the mind. So it's rational. It is emotional. I don't understand how someone can teach the Bible and not be emotional. You know, if I, um, imagine if I was standing here right now and telling you that uh, my son had just died. He hasn't, but if I was telling you that, and my son had just died, and I did it in a total deadpan way, you think, there's something wrong with that guy. You know, it's, they joke about Scandinavians, that Scandinavians are very, you know, they don't show their emotions and, and all this kind of stuff. Well, I think Scots are Scandinavians in some ways, except on the football terraces, when we cry at everything, because uh, we lose everything. But, it, you know, we, we say we don't show our emotions, and, you know, there is a kind of preacher who turns on the tears like an actor. Oh, you know, you don't. And, and you don't want that either. You just think, oh, grow up and stop faking it. But you've got to pray that God would give you an awareness of what you're actually talking about, the sheer grandeur of the glory of Jesus, the sheer wonder of what he's done. I, I remember once I was actually doing an outreach, and um, this woman came up. And she hadn't intended to be there, but she was there. At the end, she was at the front. And at the end, she said to me, David, I have a question. I'm not a Christian. I don't believe this. But you said that God loves you. How do you know that? So I told her about the cross. And I told her about Jesus. And as I was telling her about the cross, her eyes popped wide and her mouth was like that. And what amused me was the Christians around her were looking at her, seeing her stunned reaction. They were stunned at her reaction. And at the end, she said to me, David, she said, I'm not saying I believe that. But if that is true, that is the most wonderful thing I've ever heard. And it is. And yet we, we sing about how, the, may I never lose the wonder of the cross, and we do all this stuff. But sometimes it just doesn't get us, does it? We're just going through the routines. We're just going through the motions. And I, I think that we, it's, it is emotional. And of course, it's spiritual. No matter how clever we may be with words, no matter how articulate, no matter how forceful, it's only the Holy Spirit who can take the word and apply it. And it, have you ever been in that situation where, you know, yes, God works and you're not aware of him working. But sometimes, I remember one time, there was just... Utter, utter silence. Nobody dared move because they were so conscious of God being present. That's always my aim in preaching. First Corinthians. An unbeliever comes amongst you and says, truly God is with you. It's really something. It's also got to be biblical, contemporary, and Christocentric. What I mean by biblical, you're teaching the Bible. I don't know how many times I've gone to church and people have got something that they want to teach that's good. And the Bible is only used as a visual aid or a prop or a backup for it. It's not your word, it's God's word. And it's always contemporary, by the way. I know that there are people who say they're teaching the Bible and they make it sound like the Bible is only 400 years old, but it's still 400 years old. Whereas to me, like I said about Ecclesiastes, or I just did a series on Colossians, and I entitled it God's Letter to the Church in Scotland Today, because it is. You know, that's the fantastic thing about God's Word, is it's always contemporary. Sometimes people say, you've got to make the Bible relevant, to which the answer is, the Bible is relevant. It's just, it takes a particular skill to make it irrelevant, but that's a skill that many of us seem to have developed quite well. Um, and we need to move away from that. So it's contemporary, it's Christocentric. Now I don't mean by that, that every verse, you, you know, you do things like the sermon on Balaam's donkey. My first point is about Balaam. My second point is about his donkey. And my third point is about Jesus. What a wonderful savior he is. No, but what I'm saying is that Christ is the center of the scriptures, Old and New Testament, and everything radiates to him. And for me, you've got to bear in mind, at least in my context, more or less every Sunday, someone is in church who's never been there before and may never be there again. That's the key thing. Uh, it's not that I leave them with a wee snippet of the gospel. I just want them to see the beauty of Jesus that they will want to find out more. That's the key thing. That they'll, Wherever they go, supposing they're visiting on holiday from Germany, when they go back to Germany, they email and say, where can I find out about Jesus? 
It's Christocentric. Then radical, real, relational. Radical, go back to the roots. Um, I think an awful lot of what goes on in our churches is very comfortable. It fits with what's around us, and, and we're scared of the radicalness of God's word. You know, lots of people talk about being radical, but they don't really mean it. Whereas I find the Bible is sometimes so shocking. It's interesting, we decided, when I first went to St. Peter's in Dundee, there were seven people in the church, and four of them left when I went there, because that's the effect that I have on people. Um, it's, <laughs> it's what D. James Kennedy called a Scottish revival. <laughs> it was... You know, it was pretty desperate, but it began to grow bit by bit by bit. Somebody said, who are you going to try and reach? The students? And I said, well, no. I said, well, who are you going to try and reach? I said, everybody? No, no, you, know, you must be aiming for one group. No, you're kidding. I said, I'm in an old church that's falling down. that has got a cappella Sam singing for worship. It's, I'm the youngest person in the church. Who do you think I should try and reach? I'm just going to try and reach everybody. How are you going to do it? I'm just going to teach the Bible. How are you going to teach? Just watch and see. I'm, I don't know. I haven't a clue. I haven't a clue what I'm doing, um, which is true. I mean, people, if, if, ever, if any of you ever come at something and say, oh, uh, David knows what he's doing. I haven't a clue what I'm doing. I, I, literally, I, I'm a one gift person. I just teach the Bible. And, but here's the amazing thing. Students would come along and people would say, now you need to have student lunches and you need to make it really easy for the students to come and encourage them. And actually, I went the opposite way. We, all, we went the opposite way. Non-Christian students, we really warmly welcomed. And Christian students, we told them to go away unless they were prepared to work and get stuck in. We, we didn't have time for having a bunch of Christian students from the CU who wanted us to do a lot of special events and things for them and look after them. We told them to grow up and if they wanted to uh, get involved, come along. Now, people thought, ah, oh, don't be daft. Do you know what? We got loads of students because they loved the challenge. Now, the trouble is that the way things are in the Western church nowadays, people will go market at that as a strategy and write a book about it. No. Just the, the Bible in and of itself is radical. People understand that once you teach it. It's got to be real. Um, you can't, well, you can fake it. And I think there's a lot of fakery goes on, and I think Jesus challenges that. I, remember, I do remember one guy coming in saying, I really, what I really like about the church here is I just feel there's something real. I don't know what it is. And I remember one man came and he said, Dave, tell me about your church. And he'd been badly wounded and bruised in another church. And I said, well, what, you want a one-liner? Yeah, I said, well, okay. Um, we're a bunch of screwed up people in a screwed up world with a great savior. And he just looked at me and he said, I'm in. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's easy. <laughs> I said, why? He said, because, he said, I've, I've been to church and I've, you know, I'm a Christian, he said. But he said, just to hear you say that you're screwed up. He said, I know that, but churches never admit that. You know, we're all little house in the prairie, we're all happy and we're all, it's all love and, and wonderful and then all this stuff's going on underneath. No, it's not. It, 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 we're a mess. That's the thing. So, and that tied in with that is it's relational. The preaching has got to be relational. Um, like I'm looking at you just now, and to be honest, if you were snoring, I would have to do something a little bit different. Or, um, you know, people come into your church, very, very different backgrounds. Uh, how do you relate to people when you're preaching to them? Now, it's a big mistake to use the pulpit to have a go at people because you haven't had the guts to do it to their face. Don't do that. But what I mean is, you are, you've got to be aware of the circumstances of people who are there. You are talking to people on behalf of God, and it's not people in general. It's not 17th century Puritan, Puritans. It's not 21st century Chinese. It's not the perfect congregation you've got in your head. It's the mess of people you've got in front of you, and you're teaching them God's word. So it's got to be relational. Basic principles. Okay, sorry for this. In terms of, um, if, if you want, I'll send you the notes for this because it'd be easier. Um, so just email me and ask if you after because I've got five minutes. Understand text, context, and culture. Understand the text you're preaching, the context of it, and the culture that you are in. Because if you don't do that, you're going to get it wrong. Another mantra I use, contact, connect, communicate. I like allit alliteration. You're, you're contacting people. So I, I, when I go into a place... I want to try and identify something. I want to get them to listen. I want, 
Um, I'm really, really bad for using humor, but I, I don't script it. I don't plan it. I just can't help it. It's just, if I see people sitting in front of me and they're looking bored, I say, come on, guys, wake up. And I'm either rude to them or um, try and, you know, stimulate them and encourage them in other ways. You've got to contact, you've got to connect with people, and then you're communicating with people. I've seen, uh, when I was seriously ill and come back to uh, my church in a wheelchair and so on, I got depressed sometimes at some of the preaching and encouraged at some of the others. And my wife put it really well. She says, we've got some people who've got great content, but they cannot communicate. And we've got other people who are great communicators, but they've got no content. You want both. Uh, ask, answer, allow. Ask questions, answer questions, and to me, allow questions. I don't normally, as I say, have people shout out during a service. It has happened, and it's been fun, sometimes. But you have got to presuppose that if there's any dynamism at all in what's happening, people have got to be engaged. And uh, how we do that, sometimes after a service. I, I always feel that a sermon has worked if people are discussing it at the dinner table afterwards. If they just go away, I just, well, what's the point? Anyway, um, prepare, pray, and pro proclaim. Uh, you do have to prepare your sermons. Now, you don't have to prepare 15 hours for each one. But you have to prepare yourself. You have to prepare the, the passage. You have to pray. And you, you, are, you should be standing up on a Sunday morning or Sunday evening or whatever you're doing it with the absolute confidence this is the Word of God. And this is the Word of God for these people today. And actually, you should be excited about it. Martin Luther said he was tired of the Word of God, is tired of life. A preacher who's tired, I think sometimes, take a break, get out. Just, you know, you need to get that back. Love, learn, and leave. Uh, love the people. I mean, love the Lord, obviously. Love his word. Love the people. If you don't love the people, I've gone to churches where I've seen the minister, and you can see he's just so frustrated and angry with the people. You know, he's really good at hammering sinners who are right in front of him. And no wonder his congregation's going like that. You've got to really love the people. So... Sometimes you're overwhelmed by it. You're overwhelmed by the burden that you are carrying and proclaiming to them. Um, you're learning all the time. All the time you're learning. I, I, I honestly feel that I'm just starting. I've been doing it for 30 odd years. And leave. What I mean by leave is some of the results. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Leave it in God's hands. You know, you don't have to know. You just be assured that you've taught God's word faithfully. Poor preaching. Um, Victor Hugo in Les Miserables says this, to explain the Bible badly amounts to the same thing as to understand the gospel badly. We need to avoid poor preaching. Three things about it I will mention. Wrong motivation, doing it for your own glory, and that's dead easy to do. Poor theology. Theology is very important in your preaching. And being irrelevant. I know, it doesn't. The preaching of Jesus. Three things about it again as well. I think it was comprehensive, I think it was concise, and I think it was creative. I think he wanted to teach about the word of God, and so he looked around and he saw a man sowing seed. And that's what he used as an illustration. It's good to use illustrations from books, better to use illustrations from what's around you. People see that and do that. Um, what can I... Uh, well... I'm in the church of a guy called Robert Murray McShane, who actually, when you read his notes, was not that great a preacher. But this is what he said. The grand work of the minister in which he is to lay out his strength of body and mind is preaching. Weak and foolish as it may appear, this is the grand instrument which God has put into our hands by which sinners are to be saved and saints fitted for glory. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It was to this our blessed Lord devoted the years of his own ministry. Oh, what an honor has he put upon this work by preaching in the synagogues, in the temple, and by the blue waves of Galilee under the canopy of heaven. Has he not consecrated this world as preaching ground? This was the grand work of Paul and all the apostles, for this was our Lord's command. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Oh, brethren, this is our great work. It is well to visit the sick and well to educate children and clothe the naked. It is well to attend presbyteries, especially if you're a Baptist. It is well to write books or uh, to read them. But here's the main thing. Preach the word. That's still the same 
today. Nothing, nothing draws people to Jesus more than the preaching of Christ through his word. And it's a great honor to be able to do that.